Hello friends, I'm Conrad and welcome to Bad Guy Breakdowns, the series where we look at the most iconic villains to grace the silver screen. Today we're headed back to the early 20th century to catch up with the murderous Harry Powell, a character with great tattoos, troubling views on women, and a chin cleft that would make Kirk Douglas jealous. God, I mean they're, they're both just... They're both just so good though, aren't they? Why why does no one have chins like that anymore? If you could leave a like, that'd be much appreciated. And without further ado, let's get into the villainy. Harry Powell is a man of God. He goes by the title Reverend, although it's unclear which seminary he attended, and when he isn't speaking to the big man upstairs, he's reciting scripture in Robert Mitchum's inimitable, bassy, soulful baritone. H-A-T-E. It was with this left hand that old brother Cain struck the blow that laid his brother low. He has only one teeny tiny little flaw, something that is made abundantly clear within the first five minutes of Night of the Hunter. He really, really doesn't like women. So much, in fact, that when he perceives one to have transgressed his incredibly arbitrary, strict, and yet oddly inconsistent moral code, he is more than happy to bump them off with his switchblade. Powell possesses the same kind of righteous hatred of females as many real-world serial killers, driven by an unrealistic view of what a virtuous and perfect woman should be, as well as a narcissism born of his desire to hold power over them. He is a character who predates much of the modern psychological study of serial killers, but who is so well written and acted that he still captures all of the traits that make them so frightening. At his most fundamental, Harry Powell is a charlatan preacher who travels from town to town in the American South, marrying widows or otherwise isolated women, stealing their money, and then murdering them. And when we first meet him, he has just finished one such grim task, leaving the body of a woman semi-exposed in a cellar for a group of playing children to find, while he cheerfully brags about the number of people he has killed as he drives out of town. There are two important things worth noting about his character at this early stage. One, that he must genuinely believe he is receiving instructions from God, given we see him conversing with someone while he drives alone. It's not a performative act to justify his murderous intent. And two, that he views any isolated woman with money crossing his path as a sign from God that he is to continue his rampage, the money being a way to facilitate further violence. This second point is crucial because the plot of this movie revolves around his pursuit of a huge amount of money, and this character trait explains the zeal with which he does so. To him, the money he will chase throughout this story is the firmest assurance yet from God that he is on the right path. We catch up a short time later with the Reverend watching a showgirl perform, with the camera drawing attention to a violent tick which will return later in this story, Powell becoming so disgusted with the woman in front of him that his switchblade bursts through the side of his coat. It's a clear metaphor for sexual repression, perhaps even frustration with sexual rejection, although Mitchum's Powell is charming and handsome enough that to dismiss his misogyny as a result of women not being attracted to him is perhaps overly simplistic. So why is Powell even here if the performance makes him so angry? Because he is drawn to these women, and the disgust he feels at their appearance and behaviour is a projection of his own sense of self-loathing. Powell is, at his core, a hypocrite who is attracted to the women he stalks and doesn't know any other way to deal with his own sinful nature than by lashing out at the women who supposedly caused it to reveal itself. The only thing the insert shot of the switchblade punching through his jacket pocket is missing is a cartoonish boing sound effect. See? Now it makes much more sense. Harry Powell feels bad when he experiences any kind of sexual arousal and has to go stab something to get the devil out of his loins. Back at the show, Harry Powell is arrested for stealing a car, and the movie ends with our villain behind bars and no other events transpiring. Just kidding, he goes to prison for 30 days. Ah, the American justice system. During his time in the clink, he meets the first of his unknowing helpers, bank robber Ben Harper. This is a character whose main contribution to the movie is hiding a bunch of money somewhere only his infant son and daughter know where, swearing them to secrecy, and then talking about it in his sleep. Something Powell, a bit of a night owl himself, finds fascinating. And being a fan of copious sums of money and murdering widows, Powell immediately decides to head to the Harper residence after he is released. 
Meanwhile, his soon-to-be victim, Willa Harper, is busy being told by the incredibly named Icy Spoon that she needs a man, just as the train rolls into town with absolutely no foreshadowing whatsoever. Now, he's probably not even on that train. Ah, shit, he's definitely on it, isn't he? Yeah. Night falls over the sleepy town as our key players, Harry Powell and the children John and Pearl Harper, meet for the first time. Part of what makes this introductory sequence, and Night of the Hunter as a whole, so good is the lighting and the way it is shot. Darkness and light juxtaposed against one another to set mood while exaggerated, expressionistic shadows and actor blocking that doesn't quite make sense give it an otherworldly sensation, like something out of a storybook. In this scene, for example, we cut from an establishing shot of the Harper household to a wide two shot of Pearl and John sitting together on their bed. But the viewer's attention isn't fully on the children. It's on this bizarre silhouette of the window and curtains in the background, looming over the pair of them like someone mixed a cross and a gallows. This is pretty clearly some symbolism at work, as it's way too big to be an accurate depiction of what a light shining through their bedroom window actually looks like, and it becomes clear why director Charles Lawton chose to do this in a moment, as we first cut to an insert of John telling a half-remembered Bible story in close-up, follow his distracted gaze to an insert of the silhouette, before returning to the master briefly as John approaches it. Then, Lawton does something interesting. Look at where John is here, compared to his position and the position of Pearl and the bed here. John is still staring at the silhouette, but Lawton is shooting a reverse shot through it as if it were an actual window with the audience peering voyeuristically at the children as if from outside the house. You can even see the out of focus branches of trees shifting in the foreground. Does this make sense in the context of the room we've just seen? Of course not. So why did Lawton choose to do this? And the answer, I think, is tone. We already know that these children are in danger, even if they don't. By leaning into the more expressionistic elements of his set and shot selection, and essentially creating another window for John to stare through, Lawton achieves the sensation that these children are being watched. This is, in essence, an emotional POV shot, not a simulation of what Harry Powell is actually seeing, but a viable alternative to it. Why didn't Lawton just have John go and look out the actual window in the set? Because by keeping John away from the physical window, he allows this shot to happen. If John had been looking out of the window in the room, this reaction wouldn't have made sense. He would have seen Harry Powell outside and the sudden appearance of this enormous shadow wouldn't have taken John by surprise, robbing us of his reaction and thus the reveal of Powell of some of its impact. By exploiting the ethereal quality of his setting, by which we mean nothing needs to be realistic or functional because the setting and narrative exist as much in fantasy as they do in reality, Lawton is able to introduce Powell to the characters of John and Pearl as an enormous, looming shadow, unquestionably more than just a man, before he is revealed outside in a reverse shot that is incredibly creepy as a result. This entire scene is laying the foundations for Harry Powell entering the Harper household. By establishing a sense of grim fantasy through the deliberately inconsistent sets and exaggerated lighting, Powell is elevated from being a mere man who is capable of tremendously evil acts to something far, far more dangerous. A force of nature, seemingly unstoppable, and yet one John and Pearl must somehow resist. How will they get on? Not well, actually, as it turns out. We catch up with Powell in Icy Spoon's dessert parlour, and really, if your name is Icy Spoon, I don't know if you're legally allowed to do anything other than sell desserts. Where Icy invites him to stay, and essentially makes murdering Willa Harper a matter of politeness. How could you turn down that invitation? Though not before enjoying some of her delicious fudge. Powell is all shucks mams and righteous storytelling in a voice that hints at a confident demeanour and a threat of violence. Yet somehow John Harper is the only one who senses that his story might be bullshit. All preachers have love and hate knuckle tattoos, John. Stop being so old-fashioned. Icy Spoon's fudge turns out to be just the ticket for love as Willa, probably just to get the town off her back about who she chooses to or chooses not to sleep with, ends up falling for Harry's charms. Particularly after he lies to her about knowing where the money is, at the bottom of the Ohio River, apparently. John continues to be the only person in this town with even a shred of scepticism and isn't buying this nonsense either. 
Actually, I've changed my mind. You probably shouldn't trust this tattooed stranger, John. Good for you. Harry and Will are wed, and all the while the preacher makes it abundantly clear in a seemingly endless parade of tense moments in shadowy hallways that he knows that John knows that he's full of shit, and he doesn't care because he's going to find that money, kill all of them, and then get away scot-free. It's the central dynamic of the whole plot at this point, that John needs to find someone to believe him about Harry's true nature, but him being a child and this being a small town in the south, the adults are more concerned with keeping up appearances and honouring tradition than actually doing the most basic of background checks on him. Seriously, just phone the prison he claimed to work at. I am begging you. On their wedding night, Willa finds a switchblade in Harry's coat pocket, to which she responds... Yeah, sure, sure, that's, yeah, that's fine, that's fine, just boys being boys, sure, yeah, fine, Ho horseplay, haha, <laughs> sure, fine, sure, fine! Surprise, surprise, Harry immediately starts belittling Willa, breaking her down so he can build her back up into someone who is totally dependent on him. It's classic emotional abuse. Who could have possibly seen this coming? Also telling is the fact that Pal seems disgusted by the notion that they would sleep together. There's that sexual repression again. Can't let Satan's red right hand near your junk, reverend even when it's your wife, apparently. He berates her appearance while cosplaying as Ebenezer Scrooge, which is a little fucking rich, and the pair head to bed, with the implication being that this pattern of behaviour carries on for several weeks until Willa is nothing more than a shell of her former self. We jump forward and get an example of how far she has fallen into Powell's clutches when we meet the couple again in a scene shot... Well, it's shot like this. You know, sometimes it's nice when a director just makes the visual metaphor plain and obvious for everyone to see. All that Harry is missing here is a pitchfork and maybe a little tail? Just in case anyone has missed the subtle imagery, this shot here is implying that he's a bad guy. We're back in fantasy territory here. The placement of these torches is clearly more about how they impact the tone of the scene than depicting realistic lighting, although if there are examples of crowded tents lit entirely by head-high flaming torches kept within a few inches of people's faces, let me know. In this scene, they feature prominently in the initial cowboy shot of Harry and Willa as they roar about sinfulness, grow even more prominent on the close-up of Willa, then slightly retreat from view in the reverse that shows us the crowd. It's a vaguely believable series of images despite the unrealistic proximity of the torches, certainly more so than a wall suddenly becoming a window but the crowded framing made up of 96% fire and 4% humans is all about symbolism and tells you all you need to know about Harry and Willa. Walt Spoon might be beginning to suspect something about Harry Powell, but it isn't enough to spur him into action. Walter Spoon, you simply cannot be so busy in your sleepy southern dessert parlour that you do not have time to make one phone call about this. And so no one in town stops to question the indoctrination of Willa or the impact this might have on her children, who just want to make paper chain people out of money, in the case of Pearl, or stare determinedly into the middle distance if you're John. Damn, Pearl, I know you guys are loaded, but don't you think that's a little wasteful? Turn down for what? Turn down for what? Oh shit, children, hide the cash, he's right there! That wasn't very nice, boy. Have a heart. Harry pulls a page out of Being a Villain to Children 101 when he starts manipulating the more trusting Pearl to try and find out where the location of the money is. Now you see, we just can't have anything to do with John. John remains consistent in his defiance, more consistent than the layout of his and Pearl's bedroom, which now appears to have a door where it previously had a wall, which sometimes turned into a window. Willa rolls up on this moment of family bonding in an incredibly atmospheric shot, which was almost certainly an influence on this famous image from William Friedkin's The Exorcist, especially given that Friedkin himself has listed The Night of the Hunter as one of his favourite movies of all time. Willa is all smiles as she walks in through the fog, gathers up Pearl for bed as she runs away from Powell before heading upstairs herself, unaware of what is about to happen to her. By the morning, it is assumed she has run off as her car was heard starting sometime in the night. Hint for later, she didn't run anywhere. She did. Harry spreads the word around town that Willa has run off with her car, lamenting to the increasingly insufferable Icy Spoon that she had refused her marital duties with him too. Something Icy is only too happy to believe given that she, you know, absolutely sucks. It's at this point that we enter the real second act of the movie. Willa is gone, the town has embraced Harry to their bosom, and John and Pearl are completely isolated, at the mercy of the predatory preacher. They attempt to remedy this by playing around in a pile of potatoes in the basement, which was very much the fortnight of the 1920s. 
Wisely, they decide not to go upstairs when their stepfather calls them in a stunningly creepy wide shot in which Pal looms out from behind a door at the top of the basement staircase, only stopping when Icy Spoon arrives with food to distract him. Robert Mitchum's easygoing but deliberate manner of speaking once again takes centre stage here, capturing the tension in his character hidden just beneath the surface like a coiled snake. A tension that John Harper can absolutely detect, even if the Spoon neighbours remain blissfully unaware. It isn't until Icy leaves, framed within a doorway in the background of a deep focus shot that allows her to be eliminated from view and leaves us with Harry in the foreground, that we get to see the Harper children and Powell in full confrontation with each other. The preacher flits between thinly veiled threats, angry outbursts, promises of compromise, he calls John a meddler and threatens to use his switchblade on him, to which Pearl responds with possibly the most adorable reaction to the reveal of an edge weapon I have ever seen. Look at her little face! John Harper reveals that the money is hidden in the cellar and the three of them head down there to check it out. Tensions mount as Pal gets closer to realising that John has lied to him about the location of the money, reaching fever pitch when Pal puts a knife to John's throat and Pearl is forced to reveal that it is in her doll. Pal relaxes for a moment which allows John to drop a shell full of glass jars on his head and lock him in the basement, but not before trapping his hand in a door and getting a sound out of Robert Mitchum that sounds an awful lot like Mel Blanc playing Bugs Bunny. And believe it or not, this isn't the last time Harry Powell is going to conjure images of the Looney Tunes. The kids hightail it out of there, first trying to rouse the only adult who is on John's side, Uncle Woody, who actually discovered Willa Harper's body in the river earlier but kept quiet about it for fear that he would be blamed for her murder. Unfortunately for the Harper kids, Uncle Woody has sweetened up his coffee a little too much and cannot be roused from a drunken stupor. So instead they flee by boat, getting away just in the nick of time after Pearl takes forever to get in the damn thing, leaving Harry Powell wallowing in the reeds and revealing that the devil, for all his tricks, doesn't seem to know how to swim. As it turns out, Harry Powell didn't need to swim to track the Harper kids. Their journey down the Ohio River becomes increasingly desperate due to the lack of shelter and food, culminating in a panicked flight from a barn as Powell's haunting recital of the hymn Leaning on the Everlasting Arms rings out across the night, before he appears as a ghostly silhouette on horseback in a stunning shot. The kids are saved when they wash up on the shore of an elderly woman's farm, carer for local castaways and certified badass Rachel Cooper, played by Lillian Gish. And for a time, Night of the Hunter shifts to become a slightly less grim fairy tale, instead focusing on John Harper's struggle to adapt to a loving home after being abandoned and abused by the adults in his life. Unfortunately, all good things come to an end, and in the case of Miss Cooper, it comes as a result of her eldest adopted daughter Ruby being a little infatuated with boys. Powell has a sixth sense for sniffing out vulnerable young women, and is able to get information about John and Pearl's whereabouts from Ruby by buying her ice cream. He storms off to the farm, but not before considering murdering Ruby when she asks him to compliment her eyes. Harry wants that doll. Rachel Cooper, being the only adult in this movie who isn't either a murderer or an idiot, sees through this bullshit and tells him to fuck off. Powell obliges, saying he'll be back when it's dark. And boy is he. As Rachel sits guard in silhouette, Powell's hymn once again rings out into the night as the camera dollies forward to reveal the murderous preacher sat just at the edge of the yard. He and Rachel, for want of a better phrase, get into it, with some amazing visuals that we'll return to later. But for the moment it's enough to acknowledge that Harry Powell leaves this exchange with more holes in him than when he started, and retreats to Miss Cooper's barn where he is eventually arrested. And his story ends with him being dragged off for execution with a lynch mob at his heels. In the end, Powell's undoing was a strong woman with a shotgun and a sceptical child. As a force of unmitigated and inexcusable evil, he is ultimately undone by his obsession with the Harper children and their money because he, incorrectly, assumed them to be weak. Was it ever a scheme that was going to work? Could he have done anything differently? Let's find out as we get into the breakdown. I'm hesitant to judge Harry's plan negatively because, by all accounts, it is effectively the same plan that has worked for him multiple times before with multiple different families. 
He finds a vulnerable woman with enough money to bankroll his violence. He becomes close to them, but refuses any sexual interaction as that would only confirm his own hypocrisy, namely that he finds these women attractive and his depiction of them as sinful temptresses is just a projection of his insecurity with his own desires. Find the money, kill the woman, repeat. Harry subscribes to the notion that if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And you know what? It works for him. His main mistake with the Harpers was murdering Willa before he knew where the money was. He lacked impulse control, shocking for a serial killer I know, and ended up acting out his violent urges before he had the means to move on to the next woman, which meant he was then stuck trying to pump the kids for information who, to their credit, could sense that there was something up with him and grew ever more reluctant to reveal anything as a result. So really, he made a rod for his own back here. He could have not killed Willa when he did and bought himself more time to crack the kids. I suppose he could have also tried not being an obvious scumbag to the children, though that might be a little too much like asking a leopard to change its spots. Harry is, after all, a man set in his ways. Speaking of which... This is a weird movie to do awesome by association for, because Harry Powell is very much a lone wolf. He does his own thing and doesn't really get any help from anyone. With that said, there are some great supporting characters in this movie who inadvertently assist him, and this is my video series so I get to make the rules. Icy Spoon is the closest thing that this movie has to a henchman. She facilitates almost every crime that we see Harry commit by pushing Willa and the Preacher together, by not paying attention to the children's or Walt's scepticism of him, and instantly sides with Powell when he says that she has run off. What could have possessed that girl? Satan. No. She disappears from the movie when the children run away, and we're all the better for it. Then is introduced at the head of a lynch mob calling for the death of Powell and terrifying Rachel Cooper's family. She is both vociferous in her defence of any view she holds, no matter how ill-informed or stupid it might be, and is also incredibly inconsistent. The last we see of her, she is storming after Powell as part of a mob, presumably to see him hanged. Frustratingly, alive. Then swear you won't never tell where the money's hid, not even your mom. Yes, Dad. You understand? Not even her? You got common sense, she ain't. Ben Harper is one to judge his wife Willa's apparent lack of common sense, given the entire story of this movie only happens because he can't keep his damn mouth shut about the money he stole while he sleeps. Yes, he didn't mean to do it, and yes, Peter Graves' character is barely in this movie, but how else was I supposed to get a clip of Airplane into this episode? Because, yes, that is the pilot who wants to know if a little boy is a fan of Turkish prisons. Joey, have you ever been in a, in a Turkish prison? Ben Harper is hanged off screen, leaving his widow and kids to deal with Harry Powell alone and presumably not making it to pilot school. I know what you're thinking. Does Willa Harper really belong on this list? And the answer is no, not really. At worst, she is the first victim of Harry Powell's abuse and suffers a horrific fate. And at best, she is a woman just trying to survive in a world that places far too much emphasis on the institution of marriage. Help me to get clean so I can be what Harry wants me to be. But she does inadvertently assist Harry by even allowing him into her home. She doesn't see through his charming persona before it's too late, and both she and her children pay the price for it. Willa's death is undoubtedly the most visually striking in the whole movie. The scene leading up to her stabbing is shot like a stage play, with shadows and light lancing up towards a curiously angular room while Powell theatrically poses by a window, before turning his knife on her while she lies unmoving, awaiting death. Later, the kill is confirmed in another beautiful shot as Uncle Birdie finds her body and her car in the Ohio River, her hair and seaweed drifting gently in the current in an image that is very much like something out of some grim fairy tale. So that's the people who helped Harry do his dirty deeds out of the way. Now let's have a look at how many formerly living people ended up dead as a result of his rampage. We open the movie with the legs of a seemingly female body being discovered by some children as Harry Powell drives away from the scene of the crime, jovially speculating on how many women God has had him kill. We don't know how she died, but it's fairly safe to presume that it was by switchblade since that is Powell's preferred method of execution. 
Willa Harper has her throat slit and is dumped into the Ohio River along with her car to lend credibility to Powell's story that she ran away. And once the children flee the town, we hear from Walt Spoon that a farmer was stabbed and had his horse stolen. Supposedly by gypsies, but I think we know a little better than that, especially since Harry turns up on a horse shortly afterwards. And that's it. Bluebeard! 25 wine! And he killed every last one of them! No, 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 no. No. I, no, I'm not counting 23 other people that he killed off stream. You can't make me, I'm not doing it. Especially not coming from Icy Spoon and Co. They are not to be trusted. Three kills across the whole movie is pretty weak as far as horror movie standards go, but this was a trendsetter, so we have to judge it in the context of the time it was made. So, while Harry might not get all that much killing under his belt in this brief period of time we spend with him, it can't be argued that he doesn't pass the squint test as an effective murderer. Case in point, that final showdown with Rachel Cooper. Let's have a little goosey gander at it. Harry rolls up on Rachel Cooper trying to play the old shucks ma'am I'm just your average preacher with knuckle tattoos here to get my kids which unsurprisingly doesn't work. He busts out the switchblade to try and catch John and ends up getting a shotgun pointed in his face by Rachel before running away after making a funny face. But don't worry it won't be the last one he makes in this sequence. Rachel keeps watch at night while Powell sings hymns outside in an amazing dolly forward shot that puts us right back in fantasy land since she absolutely could and should shoot this man for just sitting there threateningly. But we're fully in, this is a clash of moralities and we're not really trying to keep this grounded anymore territory, so don't worry about it. Ruby approaches Rachel with a candle, causing light to fill out the window behind her through which we were watching Harry, and when the candle is extinguished, Harry is gone. The clash is on. Rachel keeps the children by her as she paces the kitchen with a shotgun and Powell makes his move, leading to a badass exchange between the two. What do you want them for? That's none of your business, madam. I'm giving you to the count of three to get out of here, then I'm coming across the kitchen shooting you. Man, Lillian Gish is cool in this. Rachel's cat startles Harry, who leaps up from the bottom of the screen into a mid-close-up that is pretty startling despite how it has aged compared to modern jump scares. Look at his fucking face! It's a brief moment where he drops the mask of civility and you see the insanity in his eyes. Rachel puts some buckshot into Harry who runs off making this noise. Yeah. Remember when I said there was another scene where Mitchum sounded like Mel Blanc playing a Looney Tune? The looping of this audio is bizarre and I think deliberately so but it feels oddly out of place and I don't feel like it really works. And seriously, compare it to this. Say, now you're cooking with gas. <laughs> Powell is apprehended in the barn by cops who arrest him for the murder of Willa Harper. Then we jump forward in time to him being sentenced to death and pursued through the streets by the lynch mob containing the spoons. The last time we see him, he is being loaded into a police car with the previously jaded executioner in the background announcing that it'll be a pleasure to see Powell hanged. A fitting end for such a villainous individual. Harry Powell is regarded as one of the greatest villains in the history of cinema by a lot of people far more noteworthy than me. Both William Friedkin and Stephen King have said that Robert Mitchum's portrayal of the character heavily influenced the way they would depict their own villains. And I think the critical acclaim The Knight of the Hunter eventually garnered is down to him in no small part. He is a captivating, layered character who is believable in his position that what he is doing is absolutely right, his zeal making him all the more frightening. He is testimony to how much you can do with a switchblade, a charming performance and the right screenplay. Harry Powell, one of the greats. Thank you for joining us on Bad Guy Breakdowns. Please consider giving the show a like as it really does help us. And join us again next time as we meander our way up to the Overlook Hotel to spend some time with Jack Torrance in The Shining. Until then, I've been Conrad, and I'll see you next time. <laughs>